So my name is David McGuire. I'm a data engineer at DVO1, and I am the tech lead for uh, the team that I'm going to talk about today. DVO1 is a Fitch Solutions company. So uh, Fitch Solutions is a sister company to Fitch Ratings, one of the three major ratings agency. So the focus of today's talk is how to build cross-functional data teams. Uh, you can create business value by marrying engineering and subject matter expertise. So this, is, uh, this can serve as a guide for anyone building data teams, um, you know, people uh, doing data mesh. Uh, this is a good guide for uh, one single domain team. So before we go into the bulk of the talk, I'm going to give you a little background on DVO1 and what we do. So DVO1 is uh, the data hub for uh, investors in structured finance. Um, so many people here will be uh, familiar with investing in stocks, ETFs, bonds. Uh, for those types of investments, you can go onto platforms like Bloomberg, Yahoo Finance, Schwab, and you can see all kinds of charts and metrics about uh, the different stocks that can help you make choices uh, towards your investments. What DVO1 does is very similar, uh, except it's for um, structured finance. So this is asset-backed securities, uh, the most famous of which is uh, mortgage-backed securities. So investors in this space are all large institutional investors, and we provide them a platform to be able to view and analyze these different bonds. You know, underlying these assets are pools of thousands, hundreds of thousands of loans so we wrangle all that data and give a very granular view into what are the holdings underneath those financial securities. Um, so this is our uh, web app on the left, and this shows uh, what um, our investors see. Basically, this is one of the more simple charts, but this is how investors can monitor performances of their bonds uh, through a web app. We offer a variety of analyses. Uh, investors can slice it and dice data um, to view it as they please, and it helps them make investment decisions. Now, behind um, this web app, we have a highly engineered stack. So our data pipeline is in Apache Spark, uh, written in Scala. We have a back end in Scala and a front end in TypeScript. So as our business progressed, a new business line sprouted. And this was credit facility analytics. So first of all, what is a credit facility? This, it's a pretty esoteric area of finance. But basically, uh, what happens is a borrower negotiates a revolving credit line with a lender. And they use this credit line to purchase loans. They could be purchasing mortgages. They could be purchasing auto loans, um, all kinds of loans. And then they use those loans as collateral to borrow more, to purchase more loans. Now, this is um, the contracts around these loans are very detailed and have, they can be hundreds of pages and have um, stringent requirements in terms of what loans can be held, uh, in terms of performance monitoring, and many reports have to be provided to the bank that provides this revolving credit line. This is kind of like um, if anybody here has a corporate credit card where you have to submit receipts, certain expenses are allowed and not allowed. This is kind of like that, but on steroids. It's these very stringent requirements, uh, very detailed, and a lot of monitoring has to happen. Um, and so this is what we do for our uh, clients, is that we, we take the um, loan data, uh, we run it through our pipeline, and then we provide all of the reports and calculations that they have to give to their lenders to um, prove that they are within the requirements of these contracts. So as this uh, business offering started, you know, we conveniently already had a loan data pipeline, our Apache Spark pipeline. So what we did is we would take data from that pipeline and use it for these offering, this offering. And this offering basically consists of two components. One is consulting. It's helping the investors make better decisions to maximize their returns on these facilities. And we do all the reporting that is required in the financial contracts. And one thing to note about this is, is these, uh, it's a very nuanced area of finance, and this is driven by analysts. It's driven by financial analysts that have deep subject matter expertise on the area. So over time, 
turned out that this was a very successful product. We had a lot of growth, a lot of new clients, but we got to the point where the current, like using the Spark pipeline that fed our web app was unsustainable uh, because a big part of our web app, um, what that pipeline does is it standardizes all pools of loans. So an investor um, could look at a wide variety of bonds and see the same metrics for each of those. But where with our credit facility offering, um, what is important is the idiosyncrasies of each pools. Credit investors, they don't need to compare um, their loan pools to any other loan pool. Um, so that, these are two different use cases that caused problems. And so what happened is that our uh, financial analysts who are experts in this area of finance, they're co-opted into doing data engineering tasks. Um, basically, sometimes they have to detransform data. Uh, sometimes they have to go to the source data and bypass the pipeline. They have to rely on Spark engineers for the execution of their data. So it was, um, this was a solution that worked in the beginning, but in order to scale and take on new customers, we needed something uh, better and more scalable. So the key differences between our SaaS offering and this new reporting service is, is one is the standardization versus tailored analysis. Like the SaaS offering makes, allows apples to apples comparison, and we really care about idiosyncrasies in this credit facilities uh, reporting. Um, the schedules are totally different. Um, the um, SaaS offering has a regular schedule of the data pipeline, whereas for the credit facility offering, it's totally driven by the decisions and the purchases that investors make, so the um, schedule can be unpredictable and episodic. Our SaaS offering is fundamentally driven by engineers. It's, you know, we have a full stack there, whereas the reporting services is driven by analysts. There's just so much nuance to this offering that analysts have to be at the center of it and the center of making decisions. So our solution is that we want to build a team heavy on subject matter expertise, but with enough engineering to be self-sufficient. And so to pursue that, we chose SQL as a language because it's a single language that can be used by both analysts and engineers, so it unifies the workflow. And we chose DBT because uh, it allows flexible orchestration in transparent data pipelines. So next I'm gonna talk about the team composition, how we um, created this team heavy on subject matter expertise with enough engineering to be self-sufficient. So overall, we have three main roles on this team. We have data engineers, analytics engineers, and um, financial analysts. As you see, I've uh, drew these as Venn diagrams because there is some overlap between these roles, but they are at the same time distinct roles. In terms of our tech stack, the core technologies that we're using are DBT and BigQuery. So the main axis that um, separates these roles is the axis between technical problems and business problems. So we have on the left, our data engineers are fully focused on business, on technical problems. Um, they're looking at you know, the very difficult um, uh, sides of like query optimization, orchestration. On the far right, we have our financial analysts, and they're focused on the business problems, understanding uh, these financial contracts, understanding uh, the nuances of these credit facilities. And our analytics engineers um, fall in between. They do a mix of both. Um, and the fact that we have overlap in these roles is, is a big asset for us because it allows us to have a lean team. And when, um, like if we have a lot of business problems at a specific time, these team, these the team can shift right and focus more on the business problems. But if the problems we're currently facing are more technical in nature, we can shift left with the analytics engineers um, more focusing on the technical problems. So I'm gonna go into each of these roles and explain a little bit more about how we view them and how we define them. So first we have our financial data analysts um, who are really driving this team and driving the product and they're fully focused on the business problems. They have significant client contact. Um, they're always trying to solve uh, business problems with clients. Um, they're trained to understand the DBT code base and to do ad hoc SQL queries, but they're not making major contributions to the DBT code base. And with the new team structure, 
They've been freed from juggling different roles and they can fully focus on their financial domain, which is where they're experts. Whereas before, as we were growing, we got to the point where they were co-opted into doing data engineering tasks. Now they fully focus on the value they bring to clients, which is being experts in um, the loan warehousing domain. Next, we have our analytics engineers. Uh, so our analytics engineers, the primary responsibility is to work end-to-end -end within the DBT pipeline. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, they're implementing business logic and tests in SQL and DBT. Um, these are analytics engineers were actually recruited from uh, existing analysts that we had uh, within the uh, company. And I'll discuss more about that later uh, in this presentation. They do possess significant subject matter expertise and have some client interaction, but they're, they're, they're very focused on working within the data warehouse with DBT. Um, you know, some example responsibilities would be code review, uh, orchestration, CICD, building models, things of that nature. Now finally, uh, we have our data engineers. Now on a day-to-day -day basis, there's some overlap between with um, the analytics engineers in terms of working within the data warehouse, um, but they tend to focus on a little bit more on engineering problems like tough optimization problems, but also uh, the data engineers have a lot more collaboration with other areas of the company, other engineers. Um, they work more upstream of the data warehouse. They have more um, work together more with uh, other systems within the company. So this, this allows the analytics engineers to be very focused on the, what's going on within the data warehouse in terms of technical implementation of uh, business logic. An important thing here is that the data engineers that join this team have been mentored by, on subject matter expertise by the financial analysts. Um, so this is, this is just an area of finance where you have to understand the context of what's, of what's happening to, to be effective. Um, so that was a key part is, uh, of, of being successful is getting, is the mentoring to get some subject matter expertise to the data engineers so that they can be effective in their job and be aware of the implication of their work. And so why do we choose SQL in BigQuery? Uh, so SQL breaks down silos. Um, and this was, this was a big key to success with this team is that we can have one tool, SQL, which the data engineers, analytics engineers, and uh, data analysts are working in the same tool. You know, previously when we had a Spark pipeline and then uh, separate tools that the analysts use, it was very difficult to have effective collaboration between the two because they were divided by their technologies. Whereas when everyone's using SQL, um, collaboration is, is very easy. And finally, we use BigQuery because it's a feature-rich data warehouse. Um, we can, it consolidates all the source and final data on one location. Um, so it's been a great solution for us. And then why DBT? So we chose DBT because it makes SQL organized, modular, and testable. And a big area of value for DBT for us is that it makes the intermediate models transparent. So on lazily executed data pipelines, you know, using software like Spark, it's very difficult to inspect the intermediate states of a pipeline. Um, you know, to do so, you typically need a debugger, do expensive uh, collect statements. But with um, DBT, the intermediate models are transparent and you can interrogate them with SQL. And this is very important because our uh, financial analysts, they have excellent intuition about, um, about the loans, about the dynamics that happen here. And sometimes if we see it, an issue, they can quickly um, identify, oh, this is, they may say, oh, the modifications of these loans are probably being represented wrong. And nine times out of 10, they're correct. But the fact that we have transparent intermediate models means that the uh, financial analysts, when they have these hypotheses, they can quickly go on their own, identify the issue. And then when they come to the engineers, they've already identified the root cause and it, it makes the uh, collaboration much easier and it makes the team much more effective. So I talked a little bit about the team structure, but we didn't just get there in a day. It, it took some time 
in some work to shift into this into a team you know fully driven by analysts to a team where they're still driven by analysts but with um, enough engineering to make them self-sufficient. So one of the, the fundamental things that we did is we ran a SQL training. And we did this across the entire company, not just for the analysts within the credit facilities team. Um, and the goal of this was to teach all analysts in the company to be able to interrogate data using SQL. And we also wanted to provide a foundation uh, for analysts who were especially interested and wanted to go deeper um, into the engineering side of, of data. And so these are the general steps that we took in terms of designing our SQL training. Um, you know, as a prerequisite, we migrated to BigQuery, so all our data was available in one, one place, in one data warehouse. Um, and then the second thing we did is we surveyed the analyst workflows. Um, we really wanted to understand what are their daily tasks, what are they, um, how are they interacting with data, or what tools are they using. And a lot of the analysts are using R and Excel. And so in terms of designing a curriculum, it's very important to understand, like, what are their problems today? How are they solving them? And then after that, we designed a tailored curriculum based on the survey of the analyst workflows and then started the course. So in terms of designing the SQL curriculum, these, we um, had a few guiding principles. Uh, one was a comparative approach. So we didn't just say, this is how you do um, you know, query data in SQL, or this is how you do an aggregation in SQL. We started with uh, an example, a comparison from either R or Excel or another tool for every operation in SQL. Even the most simple operation select statements, we take a chunk of R code and say, here's how you do a select statement in SQL, and to the more complex aggregation, CTEs, window functions, um, everything was compared to other tools that they currently used in their day-to-day uh, -day, um, in, the, in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and so, yeah, the and examples are all practical. Like every every operation, like a, if we demonstrated select, it was a select that they would that an analyst might actually have to do in their workflow. If it was a window function, it would be a calculation that analysts do every day. Uh, and then finally, um, we didn't use any of the you know, typical cookie cutter exercises for um, in SQL trainings. Like you, know, you have a lot of sales data with you know, customers, orders, items, table. Um, it's this valuable way to learn SQL, but our data is very different. And the, the types of operations and the joins are just not applicable to the workflows uh, within our company. So, is, is really key um, to design a curriculum with these principles to make sure that analysts learn SQL and learned it in a way that was practical, practical and immediately applicable to their workflows. So I mentioned earlier that we uh, recruited our analytics engineer from existing analysts in our company. Um, so why did we do that? Um, you know, some people might say, why don't you just hire analytics engineers? A big part of it is because domain uh, knowledge is very important in, in our offering. Um, we already had analysts that deeply understood our niche of finance, and they're already using, you know, they're using R, and they're interacting with data. So we decided that we want to build existing analysts into analytics engineers. And so who did we recruit? Uh, we used our SQL training as a way to get candidates to uh, become analytics engineers. So as we went through the SQL training, we saw um, some analysts were especially technically oriented. Uh, so we took uh, analysts from those, but we also were looking for analysts that showed interest. Like it was, it was important that uh, we found analysts that both had like the technical orientation and the ambition to grow in an engineering sense. Um, and then finally, how did we do this mentoring? do this um, training is we did it through mentoring. We paired the analysts with experienced engineers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the keys to a successful mentoring program. 
Uh, first of all, you have to align incentives. Um, you know, the engineers that were um, mentors, it, you know, mentoring takes time. They weren't completing as many tickets as engineers who had no mentoring responsibilities. So you have to recognize that. Um, and you have to uh, reward those engineers in performance reviews. Otherwise, they're just not gonna give uh, you know, the level of effort because they'll be disadvantaged relative their, to their peers who don't mentor. Uh, a second thing that we did is we defined core competencies. So for all analytics engineers, there's a core set of competencies that everybody has to have. And an example of a few of the important ones are writing performance SQL, uh, code review and PR practices, uh, and CI, CD. So we, we wanted to make sure that all of our analytics engineers had those core competencies. Next, we developed uh, personalized learning plans. So this is where um, the mentor relationship really helped. The engineers would work with the analysts and help them to understand, like, what are the gaps? What are, what are the things they're missing to be effective engineers? And then they created, you know, personalized uh, learning plans. The, the mentees then, um, w then learned from that, you know, engage, engaging in self-study, um, you know, bouncing questions off the uh, mentoring engineers and using them as guides as necessary. And then finally, um, we did a lot of pair programming. So basically we took the approach of like, I do, I watch you do, and you do. And so we started with relatively simple tasks, like, like take existing models and make some you know, minor changes, maybe add a column, uh, you know, add an extra calculation. And then as the, uh, as the analyst grew, uh, we get progressively, um, we give them progressively more uh, difficult tasks, like building models, building entire DAGs, um, but following this, this principle, of I do, I watch you do, uh, and you do. And so uh, uh, another um, aspect that was very important to, to making this an effective team um, is instituting a culture of test-driven development. So test-driven development is something that engineers are uh, very familiar with, uh, but it's not um, generally in the awareness of analysts. So uh, you know, we strive to, to promote those ideas across the team, and we really um, believe that the testing is, starts with the analysts. You know, the analysts, they're the ones that understand the business logic. They understand the requirements. They're the ones that are working with clients, going through these uh, long uh, financial contracts. And as they define the requirements, the calculations, they suggest tests for each of them. Um, and then they hand these off to um, the engineers who implement the tests. Um, and so this is very important because it allows us to have a complete testing suite that's not loaded with tests that just add noise. Um, you know, if the testing was fully on the engineers, they wouldn't have the same context, so we'd probably um, end up testing things that are not so important, uh, you know, leading to alert fatigue in, you know, unnecessary tests, or even miss important things. But um, involving the analysts in the testing workflow um, makes it, um, makes, makes our, our pipelines in our reporting suite uh, much more robust. And so, in terms of the impact of the testing culture, it helped us go from reactive to proactive. Um, you know, before, um, before this transformation, you know, there, we'd produce a report, and there might be something off, and you go back into the pipeline. Um, the analysts, uh, you know, might have to, uh, you know, be bugging the Spark engineers to solve their problems. But with um, the test-driven culture, we can be proactive, like before we calculate, any uh, reported value for clients, we validate that all the data is in place and it's in, the, it's in expected condition so that that calculation uh, will be valid. And um, also we implemented this um, data quality report card. Um, so basically, if looking at this report card, we have the left side, which is basically the, re it's a high level aggregate of like tests on um, the data layer and on the right, we show the impact of the tests on reporting calculations. And so if we look at the uh, left side here, um, basically we've got just like a high level um, aggregate of like 
you know, the percent of columns that pass all tests, that have warnings, um, that have failures, and you know, some examples of the warnings and failures below. And now on uh, the right, we show the impact of those tests. Um, we show like what percent of calculations, reported calculations for clients are affected uh, by, all, by these test results on the raw data. Uh, and, and this is very important because in the data, not all columns are equal. There's a, there's a set of fundamental columns that drive almost every calculation. And there is a set of columns that um, you know, might be used in one calculation or, or two calculations and are less important. And this view allows us to get, uh, quickly get an idea of like, what's the state of our data and what's the impact of any issues we have. So if you see here, we have uh, columns affected. This is just an example where it's 2% of columns have uh, failures. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, in terms of like the scope of columns that are, that have failures, um, it's very low. But if you look at the reporting layer, we see 50% of calculations are affected. So this, this would tell us that um, we have failures in some of the fundamental calculations um, that, you know, drive our, um, that drive our reporting. And you can also have the converse, like sometimes you may have, um, you could have a high number of failures, but a very little, little impact on uh, the uh, reporting calculations. So it, it's, 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 this is very important, and it's a, a high-level way that we can understand the results, and especially the, uh, for the analysts, um, they, can, um, they can use this to help diagnose problems. So in conclusion, um, you can build a team that creates business value by marrying engineering and subject matter expertise. Um, and SQL really is a fundamental technology for this because it puts everybody using the same tool. If people are using different tools, um, it's, it's very difficult to have effective collaboration, especially if they don't understand each other's tools. Um, and DBT makes uh, SQL modular and testable. And yeah, I'm thinking my slides are available on GitHub at this uh, QR code uh, on the bottom left if you're interested. And yeah, thank you.